start. Ready? Oh, no, okay, great, thanks. <laughs> And after graduating from the University of Agricultural Science, um, he, got, he got his PhD degree in Texas A&M, and then worked for the University of California and Texas A&M. Um, he has published 170 peer-reviewed peer papers, and uh, uh, he has been chair or co-chair for more than 20 symposiums. And now he is a professor of the Department of Horticulture Science in Texas a and uh, he is also the director of uh, Vegetable and Fruit Improvement Center in Texas Agri, Agri uh, Research. Well, mm, Mom always said that I, I, I never they keep the doctor away, um, and he and she se seems to be right. So, what has the scientist found to to support the mom's idea? Well, today our speaker is going to tell you something about the nutrition in fruit and uh, vegetables. Well. I, I, with our warmest applause, let's welcome uh, Dr. Bimu Patil. Thank you. Howdy. Howdy. Thank you for the nice introduction and, uh, again, uh, starting about the fruits and vegetable importance. So, again, thank you, Dr. Wu, for uh, inviting me to give a presentation to this group. Again, uh, what I'm going to do is I think you have heard the speakers from the last several weeks about a lot of more of a molecular approaches. So I'm going to touch a little bit based on how we can increase consumption of fruits and vegetables. Because I think whether you are nutrition students or, or uh, horticulture students or food science students, irrespective of whatever your major is, you have to eat fruits or you have to eat food in general, right? So I'm going to start with that. So my overview of the presentation will be I'm going to talk about some of the historical perspectives of the general diet and health and what is happening with some of the citrus health benefits. And then I'm going to touch some of the evidences of citrus health benefits on uh, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And then I'm, at the end, I'm going to put you some of the challenges as a graduate student where you can take this research and then what is immediately needed to keep this country healthy, means people of this country healthy and global population also to be healthy. So with that introduction, I'm going to start with how we evolved as a human being. And there are some students in, my, in the audience, some of my students, they are aware of this slide and some of the slides here. Probably they get bored today. <laughs> so uh, I teach a class on science supports for health. So some of these slides are at least one or two slides are coming from that class. So this is how we evolved as a human being, uh, 2,000, 2.5 million years ago, and then we started eating meat as a source of protein. That's still good as of, as of today. Then we kind of a little bit sidelined to eat carbohydrate food and rich food. So then we are here, right? We are not just eating this meat. We are not eating just carbohydrate. We are drinking a lot of soda, right? junk food sometimes. Maybe I should be very careful when I'm stating to the nutrition students, right, junk food. So, but anyway, we are in this industrial revolution of obesity. At the same time, also, we're dealing with the malnutrition and hunger in some of the countries, I, even in this country. There are about, so how many of you believe that the United States has people who are starving for food? Yes? How many, how much percentage, are, what is the number? So about 14.5 million people are suffering with hunger and malnutrition in this country also. Of course, there are other countries having really major challenges. So 
that's where we are now. Uh, yeah, okay. So we're in the situation of the obesity, which is, a few years ago I used to think it is only in the United States, because we said earlier about 35% of the population in this country are obese, are obese, are going to be obese. So now when I travel around the world, I see that even some of the developing countries, which they claim there are not, there's no food, but there is obesity there. That's an unfortunate thing, right? It's, it's supposed to be malnutrition there, but it is also obesity. I was in Indonesia, Brazil, uh, China, and India, of course, there is obesity problem too. I'm, I'm just listing these countries, but around the world, there's obesity is increasing. So why were there? Why are we having this situation in the last 20, 30 years? Can anybody guess? Okay. That's my answer. Again, you may be disagreeing with this. So in 1960, there is a big food industry really bumped into us and then tried to produce some of these Coke and Sprite and fat, uh, fast food. So that's where the chemical warfare started, wherein we got into this, are addicted to this, right? So that's where the obesity is coming from. Partially it is the food we eat, sometimes we over it. But this is where we are now. We are really dealing with the obesity problem. That's a bigger challenge than what we think. Let us say if we really contracted that in 1960, maybe we would have not been talking about obesity now. Maybe you would have not had a research question for your graduate research, right? Some of you are probably dealing with obesity, right? So in any case, this is where we are now. So unfortunately, the obesity leads to a lot of the oxidative stress in our human body. So you can see that obesity, oxidative stress leads to uh, diabetes and cancer, hypertension. There are uh, other things that also, I'm just highlighting type, uh, type 2 diabetes and uh, cancer and hy hypertension, which is, which is because of the obesity. So we need to be cognizant about not just obesity, how it leads to other chronic diseases. This is really important for us to understand. Sometimes obesity, of course, before we were born, one time there is a trend in the United States that if you're fat, you're really rich and more actually in demand at that time, some time back, like before all of us were born, not now. But now the trend is different. But unfortunately, the obesity is leading to a lot of these challenges, which we need to address as a nutrition students and horticulture students also, because horticulture, nutrition, and food science has to go in hand in hand to really address some of this. Only one, one science cannot solve this problem. So, that's why in the United States we started, how many of you have heard as a nutrition student about the, the food guide pyramid, right? So there is a history, in, back in 1980s, in the United States, we have started promoting eating more fruits and vegetables. So maybe I'll ask the students in nutrition science here, how many of you are eating enough vegetables and fruits per day? Very few, right? Even my students are not eating. They're doing research on that, but they're not eating too. So that's an unfortunate thing. So we have been spending a lot of money in promoting these fruits and good fruits and vegetables are good for you, but unfortunately the general population is not eating. It's very, very minimal. I'll show that in a, in a few minutes. But this is where we started in 1980s. I don't have all the slides to show that historical evidences because of the time. But you can see that in 2005 we tried to promote not only eating fruits and vegetables, we tried to promote physical activity also as a part of that. Even then still people didn't eat. On an average, we're eating about 2.2 servings of fruits and vegetables per day, which is not good. We recommended a few years ago, about 20, uh, 15 years ago, we recommended five servings of vegetables and fruits, but we are not there yet. But then 2005, we added physical activity is one of the factors. It didn't help. So then we thought people are really not understanding the science behind it, that uh, the government started making it easy. How many of you heard about this? Okay, so you heard about it, but how many of you are practicing it? I'm going to ask a lot of questions during this, the, the seminar, okay? Very few of us are practicing, right? The goal is here, instead of remembering how many numbers, like one time we started with five slogans, then we started 13 has to be per man and 11 servings per woman, that was before 2005. And then we started with this, the physical activity. Then we started with my plate. I thought this is easier because half of the plate has to be fruits and vegetables. Unfortunately, we didn't get that also. We are not addicted to that. We are addicted to McDonald's. Unfortunately. So if you really look at this, say we wanted really why fruits and vegetables are not still consumed enough is a question. It's partially maybe us. And I think in future 
if you continue this road, you may be also responsible. Right now you're studying and understanding it, but in future we may be responsible also. But partially as a scientist, it's, it's we're not, when I say we're not doing enough, I think we're not doing all the things needed to increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables. That's a challenge. So this is where we are now. If you look at the consumption, our uh, total intake of recommended dose, when I say recommended dose could be every five years it has changed. As I said, it was 13 and 11 servings one time, it is five servings one time. One time there was a slogan called more the matter. So there is no need of counting, but just eat enough fruits and vegetables. So for example, here if you look at the vegetable consumption, about almost 85 to 90% of the population in this country are eating lesser than the recommended. So for the benefit of the horticulture industry, who, which we grow fruits and vegetables, and for the producers who grow fruits and vegetables, if let us say if, if the population, about 80, if we shifted to 50% of the population eating fruits and vegetables, we may not have enough fruits and vegetables. That means the producers can make more money, right? Or even the vegetables and fruits, same. But unfortunately, if you look at the bottom, you can see that the sodium consumption is very high on the right side. It's beyond the expectation. Sugar is high, but luckily grains are they're eating enough. Not in, when I say enough, but at least the, the, the population eating grains is higher than recommended uh, numbers. So at least the grains are really eaten very well compared to fruits and vegetables. This is an important thing for us to know. So because of this, 2005, you know, United States came up with some guidelines. There was a controversy. How many of you heard about the controversy with the food guidelines last, uh, last year, actually? Yes. There's a big push on, OK, meat is still good for you. Fruits and vegetables are not good. So there is lobby almost. Unfortunately, science got into the lobby group. So this is what they recommended. You had to eat fruits and vegetables. And public, it's a public health concern. So finally, they released the guidelines. Of course, there are five recommendations. I'm not going to spend time in reading all the guidelines, but on the top, there is a follow healthy eating pattern. What does that mean is, if you look at the left side here, healthy eating pattern is you have to have fruits and vegetables in your plate, and grains and dairy and on the oils. What they're also recommending is reduce these things, uh, the sugar and, and sodium or salt. So, but unfortunately, again, we're not eating. But this is, again, this is 2005 and 16. So we're hoping five years down the road, there is some change. We again, this was, again, hope. We, it didn't happen that way in, in, until now. So this is the trend of the consumption of fruits and vegetables, even though they are very rich. For example, vitamin A is very high in, in mostly vegetables, not fruits. I'll show you that in a minute why I'm say, showing these five slides. And for example, if you look at I'm, I'm again going back here now, the fight between vegetable and fruit. Fight means who is eating more fruits and vegetables, right? And among them, who is eating more fruits compared to vegetables, even though the vegetables are rich in nutrients. For example, here you can see that the, uh, the top five fruits and iron content is vegetables, right? And again, folate content. How many of you know the importance of folate? I see a lot of people here probably will need to know about that in a very short time, in, in probably not too long ago. So folate is really good for the neural defect. If you're pregnant, if you have to eat more than at least 400 milligrams of folate to get better pregnancy and, and the childbirth. So in any case, so this is like, you see that a lot of vegetables are rich in folate content too, not, not fruits. And again, vitamin C, again, it's kind of mixed. We always think the vitamin C is high in, in citrus fruits, but you see that peppers have higher vitamin C. So what you see in this next slide is only fruits are rich in sugars, right? But the interesting part is the kids are not eating vegetables. They are, eat, they are preferring fruits, even though the nutrient-rich vegetables are there. Again, I'm not being, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with both fruits and vegetables in our research. I'm not promoting either one of them. I'm basically trying to understand and, and promote in both ways. But what is, what is the trend is the taste. Fruits are tasty because it has a lot of sugar, right? So you can see the trend, the fruit consumption is increased or at least a little higher level, but the vegetable consumption is going down, even among the kids of two to 18 years. That's an interesting thing going on. So now, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to show you an evidence. So if I ask you, I think most of you are graduate students, right? So if I ask you, how many of you believe that fruits and vegetables play a role in, in preventing cancer or heart diseases or diabetes? Help, role means preventing, of course. Yes, two. So any, anybody? Four, yeah, I see only a few of them. So you are graduate students. I think I'm, most, I'm assuming most of you are understanding the role of these fruits and vegetables in your health. 
So there are very good evidences that the fruits and vegetables play a bigger role in cardiovascular diseases. Very good evidences. I will show that in a minute. But there are still a lot of evidences are needed in cancer prevention. And I think the rest of my talk will be focused on that. And of course, I will get back to the citrus in a, in a few minutes. But this is where we are now. So the reason I say that, this is my another favorite slide I use in most of my presentation. Uh, this is for, again, again, this is good for the non-nutrition students, but maybe nutrition students also need to know anyway. So where we are now is basically we're depending on a lot of ancient knowledge here, right? We need to do a lot of mechanistic studies, and Dr. Wu and several of the nutrition faculty do a lot of research on in vitro and in vivo studies. There are a lot of clinical trials has to happen to really promote these fruits and vegetables. And then after the clinical trials are done in a randomized control uh, trial, there should be a meta-analysis. What does that mean is that out of 1,000 studies, they select certain studies, like 8 or 10, based on certain criteria, then pick certain 8 of those studies. If the meta-analysis shows that this fruit or a particular compound in a fruit or vegetable is good for you, then you can promote easily without any questions asked. The reason we are not in eating enough now, because as the introducer said that earlier, mom said apple is keeping you better, right? We have been told that you have to eat fruits and vegetables. Unfortunately, we have not been providing a lot of scientific evidence to the consumers, including the students. That may be the reason, again, I'm, that's my guess, we are not eating enough fruits and vegetables. So we, we, we do a lot of these cell culture studies, randomized control studies. Again, every, every study needs a lot of money. And unfortunately, these studies and the clinical trials lead a lot of money. And we are not having a good source of funding to really encourage that type of research. We are expecting it, people to eat more fruits and vegetables. So that's where our challenge is. So if we reach that, then we can really promote success. So that means you can see that right now there are millions of uh, the old studies claims, at least, in different countries. There are very few studies on, on randomized control trial, very few on, 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 on reaching to the meta-analysis. So what I'm going to show you in about five minutes is to show you an evidence that how fruits and vegetables can show some of these aspects on cardiovascular diseases. So that way you will understand why I've said that earlier, cardiovascular diseases are good for you. I mean, I'm saying fruits and vegetables are good for cardiovascular disease prevention, right? So this is an example where if you increase consumption of fruits and vegetables to seven servings a day, I'm saying servings, okay? You don't, how many of you know, maybe I had to hear always ask for the nutrition students, horticulture students may not know much. What is serving means? Nutrition students should answer that question. No? If I take an apple, a small apple, a small apple is of course one serving, but if you take a big apple, half an apple is one serving, or four carrot pieces is one serving. So you think it is impossible to eat seven servings of fruits and vegetables? No. This basically we're not making an attempt. But just show you that this is one of the human intervention studies. You can see that when you increase the fruits and vegetables to seven servings, you can reduce the almost coronary heart disease significantly, about almost 30%. So that's a big 30% reduction in heart vascular disease is a big thing, right? So the next study is also showing you this is another interesting study. They, they, they did about 50, 54,000 men. This is a human study, okay? It's not a test tube cell culture studies. Human studies, you can see that citrus is one of the major factor in leafy green vegetables. So of course, this is a study for all the fruits and vegetables, but it's interestingly, if you increase fruits and vegetables to 600 grams per day, you can reduce almost 30%. You can see that from almost 80 to almost almost 40 percent of the stroke. This is a cohort study. This is a lot of questionnaire study, of course, not really randomized control study, but still these are very valid studies. So right now in the United States, how much of consumption of fruits and vegetables, not the servings, in terms of the grams, how much you think you are eating? On an average, it's 400 grams. That's still good. But if you increase to 600, there is a study also done if you increase to 600, we can reduce or save about $2,000 per person in healthcare cost. If you just increase from 400 to 600. That's a big number, right? So, so this is again an evidence that if you increase the fruits and vegetable consumption, you can reduce the healthcare cost and also the stroke. So this is another study. I think some of your students are aware of that. Like This is what I said, meta-analysis, like you take about 1,000 studies, you take only selected 8 or 10, 
these are again when I list here some authors you can see that these are the selected studies based on certain criteria in the meta-analysis. They showed that if you take again servings again for example here three servings and five servings of fruits and vegetables the risk reduction relative risk is significantly reduced. So the good news is most of the studies are showing lesser except one study less than one so risk reduction less than one is always good. So that means at least if you eat five servings you are reducing about 26 percent of the risk reduction of the the stroke. This is a meta-analysis, the one I said in the top. So of course there are a lot of studies, I'm, because of the time I'm not going to show you on, on cardiovascular diseases, but there are studies also on cancer, but not reached to this level into meta-analysis where you can claim these are good for particular cancer, unfortunately. We're doing a lot of research. We have probably 10,000 literature on each of these bioactive compounds in, in cell culture and, and animal model, but not to the human clinical trial. It's a little bit hard also to do that research. Right? So, but in any case, this is uh, showing you that the fruits and vegetables play a bigger role in, in stroke at least. So now I'm going to the, the topic what I said about in my seminar title. So this is one of, how many of you know about this fruit? Not many? I, I expected my students should know, horticulture students. Anyway, this is one of the citrus species. I, I had to ask the students, what is citrus? You know that, right? No? So can, can grapefruit can be considered as citrus? How many of you tasted grapefruit in Texas? OK, so that's good. So grapefruit is one of the citrus fruit, for just in case if you're not aware of it. So this is one of the tree called Buddha tree. Of course, the reason is, of course, there are, if you go to market, sometimes you may not find the citron species as like this only. Because the, the, the tree looks like a Buddha's finger, they call it as, and this is very famous in China, actually. So it's very healthy. They consider that as a healthy fruit. This is one of the historical fruit in citrus species. They use this for humans for a lot of other potential diseases. So it's called Buddha trees. The botanical name is citron. So historically, that's what it is. So now I'm going to pause for a minute. How many of you drank or ate citrus fruit in the last one week? Everybody? Very few? OK. Why you drank or ate fruit? citrus fruit, for example, orange or grapefruit or mandarins. Why you, why you ate? Because your mom told you or <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes? What is the? It tastes. It tastes, yeah. That's, that's important. I, I'll, I'll conclude that my seminar with that. That's good. So yes, citrus is good for you. But historically, if you ask some people 20 years ago, they, they would say citrus is good because it has a lot of vitamin C. At least when you were a kid, your parents are putting in uh, orange juice b along with the cereal because they think it is really good in uh, the vitamin C, right? And that's still true. Vitamin C is still true. It is rich, rich in vitamin C. But what I'm going to show you is before the end of the seminar, I'll convince you it is citrus is not just only vitamin C. It has other compounds which are good for you. So hopefully if I can convince, I'll, I'll probably justify your time. So this is where the, the vitamin C story started. Back before you and I were born, in 1497, there was a disease called scurvy. Vasco de Gama, when he was doing all the, the trips through ship, so he found that a lot of people are suffering with some of the major problem. It's called scurvy. And then uh, Keriter, he cured this not by citrus. He used the one of the ornamental plant, Thuja. Thuja is one of the ornamental plant, ox Thuja occidental. It's one of the ornamental, but you can. So they used that and they found that is a good, good cure also for the scurvy. But later, Dr. Lund, uh, Lind, he, he was actually a, a surgeon and he had the same situation in the ship. So people were suffering with uh, scurvy. So he really did a clinical trial. It took about 150 years to find that one of this citrus compound, vitamin C, citrus means general lemon, lime, or whatever the citrus fruit you think, it took about 150 years to show that this particular citrus juice, which has a lot of uh, vitamin C, helps in preventing scurvy. So followed up again, uh, Dr. Mr. Blaine also showed that his basically conclusion is same. Okay, this is really helping. So people do not have to die with scurvy, with the citrus. So they, if they can give the citrus juice during the, the sip, uh, they can really survive with that. So that was the reason. The citrus whole story started with vitamin C linking to scurvy. And then, of course, there are a lot of other benefits that showed that. So now, that's why I was asking you earlier, 
So if I ask you 20 years ago, uh, I think I gave a seminar in the nutrition uh, series in 2003. I asked the same question to a lot of nutrition students at that time. They said, yes, I'm drinking because of the vitamin C. At least at that time, they said it is because of vitamin C. I didn't see, hear the answer from you guys. Is it the modern era is going backwards? No, right? But anyway, so we thought citrus has only vitamin C, right? So it's not just vitamin C. It has limonoids. It has flavonoids. It has potassium. It has pectin. It has carotenoids, folic acid, fiber, and cumarins. So let me ask you to guess some numbers. If I take all of these categories of compounds, how many compounds do you think citrus has? Can you guess? No? Approximately. I, I don't have to guess. And I don't have the real number too, actually, unfortunately. But it's approximately about 500 compounds. So if you're drinking orange juice or different citrus fruits, you're getting about 500 compounds, which we know now. Again, do I know all the biological activity of those? I don't know. So there are a lot of compounds in citrus, which has, again, today I'm talking about citrus, but if I'm talking about carrot, it's a similar situation. Just don't eat only citrus fruit and forget about carrot if you're liking carrots, okay? So what I'm saying is there are a lot of things which are unknown in plants. We're now almost taking into account and understanding the role of these. So these are some of the 500 compounds in citrus alone, and which, again, as we go along, we may be finding 600. We don't know because a lot of compounds are not. I'll show you that in a minute. If you just take the limonoids, we have about 57 limonoids. I'll show that in a very few, uh, few slides. That way you understand why I'm saying 500. So these are different citrus species. If you are not heard about citrus, citrus is not just only orange, right? It has grapefruit, mandarins, lime, lemon, and you can see there are other species also. There are several species of citrus you find in the market. Some you, not, you may not find these in the market, but at least those you find in the market, right? So these are compounds I mentioned. So again. To speed up the, the presentation, I'm just going to list some of the benefits of the citrus fruits in uh, obesity, and I'm going to show you some preclinical pre -clinical trial and clinical trials. But just to get an idea, maybe that if you focus on just the, the bulleted blue colors, citrus in preclinical pre uh, trials has shown some good activity. For example, lipogenesis-related genes were triggered by one of the citrus species, which you may not have heard that species, citrus dip depressa. Again, the names of these citrus are also coined by different authors in a different way. Again, I'm not going to get into the citrus classification now, but there is a guy named Swingle. He classified all the citrus species into 16 only. There is another guy who's classified the whole citrus into 159. So when you see the name, these, this is hard to really say, but there are only six species which are commercially available now. So you don't have to get confused about all of that for this particular presentation. But what I'm showing you is different, for example, bergamot has very good effect on cholesterol and reducing, again, obesity. And citrus limonene glucoside, which I talk uh, in, in a few minutes, a little bit more, so that has potential for liver disease also. Again, moro, citrus sinensis. When you say citrus sinensis, it's an orange species, basically, but it's, it's a different source of the citrus orange. So you can see that that has also helped in weight management. And the randomized control trial has shown Again, reducing the abdominal obesity and, and reducing the uh, triglyceride. Flavonoids, citrus flavonoids are very good, and again, they can control or uh, help in metabolic uh, dysregulation and obesity. So again, this, these three slates, again, on obesity related, what you see is some of these compounds are the one which have been targeted so far. Again, future may be different, but at least some of these compounds are targeted on some of these specific biological activities the one I just showed you the previous slide, which is basically a summary of what is the research on citrus obesity. So coming back to heart health, again, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of lab studies done. We have done a lot of studies at uh, the, our center. And polymethoxyflavonoids and the role of those are really good in, in reducing cholesterol. And hesperidin is one of the compound in mostly orange juice. Vascular protection. And again, orange juice has shown elevated HDL, HDL. But normally, it is very hard to increase HDL. How many of you know what is HDL? Everybody, right? So have you seen by any eating fruits and vegetables, you can increase HDL? Nutrition students, particularly. It's very hard because I have my own personal experience, very, very hard. Only by physical activity, you can increase. But again, if you take some of the cholesterol medication, your HDL will go down. Actually, unfortunately, you need you need the HDL to be going up. But unfortunately, if you take the 
the Lipitor or Crestor or whatever the medicine you if, if your parents or family friends are taking, HDL is not going to go up, it is going to go down unfortunately. But physical activity with certain, but at least some of the flavonoids in citrus has shown an increase in HDL and it is a small extent, not really in a big way. So as I said earlier, the citrus fruits have potential for reducing stroke. For example, here there are two types of stroke. One is for the lack of blood flow and another one is due to bleeding. So you can see that there are a lot of population, 6.9 million people have stroke uh, with ischemic stroke and 3.4 million are having a hemorrhagic uh, stroke. So if you look at some of the flavonoids or flavonones particularly, because flavonoids have a big classification, flavonoids, flavonones and flavonols. Citrus has mostly flavonones. Flavonols are present in onion and apple and other, other fruits. So for example, citrus mostly you find flavonones. So flavonones, for example, polymethoxyflavonoids, have, you can see that this is again a human study. By consuming more flavonones, you can reduce the relative risk for a point, point 0.81. So that's about 19% reduction in risk by stroke. This is just citrus. The one I showed you earlier, the meta-analysis study, was all the fruits and vegetables. But citrus has some significant effect. And again, if you take citrus juice, the, the, the lesser effect, interestingly, I don't know. I was expecting the other way. If you eat the whole fruit, you are getting better reduction, right? But in this case, there's again a small difference there. This is another human study. Again, I'm not a proponent of citrus juice as, a, as, a, as my own belief because when you, again, if you squeeze the juice on your own without adding sugar, probably juice is good. But if you buy in a market, you are probably adding a lot of sugar. It's almost drinking like a Coke in my definition. So to burn one of that glass of juice, whatever you buy in the market, you need to at least jog about 30 minutes, those calories. At least jog means walk, at least. Jog means, of course, you can burn better. But this is the way we see that. So having said that, citrus juice not only provides you sugar, but it has other potential benefits. So for example, the flavonoids present in citrus juice, orange juice particularly, you can see here, so this is a control, and this is the metabolic syndrome, uh, syndrome patients with citrus juice consumption. When you see that, and this is where the, the placebo. So when you see that, the, the LDL, you know LDL means a bad cholesterol, right? So you can see that by consuming citrus juice with the people with the metabolic syndrome also were able to reduce the LDL significantly over six months. Again, it's not a magic button. You cannot achieve that in one or two days. It's, it, they were consuming two glasses of juice, orange juice. They were able to reduce the LDL significant way. And also the C CRP protein. Again, sorry for the spelling. Here, the right spelling. What is CRP? C-reactive protein. That's one of the marker for your, your heart health, right? So you can see the similar thing. So when you add the juice, in human study, you can reduce the CRP also significantly. That's a good thing from drinking juice. Unfortunately, we're all spoiled a little bit. We want everything ready-made. So we don't have time to make juice. So that's why this, this studies have to be done by the, the juice itself, right? So that's a good, good, good sign. So we also did some study in collaboration with the University of Arizona. It's a human clinical trial. We gave grapefruit juice because we grow a lot of grapefruit and Texas is known for grapefruit, very sweet grapefruit compared to any parts of the world. Again, I'm not here for promotion. <laughs> we're, we're, it's truly, uh, what I said is true because when you compare California, Arizona, or even South Africa, or Texas grapefruit are sweeter uh, the, because of the climatic condition in the South, te South Texas. So when we did the grapefruit uh, study with uh, obese uh, women uh, who are recovering from the breast cancer, actually, so this is again, we do a lot of the human clinical trials with the collaboration. So this is one of the study, again, we start with the field level to, I call this farm to the clinic, to the human clinical trial. We, do, we also do the human cell culture work in our lab. So for example, here, when, we, when they consume this uh, grapefruit for six weeks, you can see the significant reduction. When I say significant, of course not by the error bars here, there is a significant reduction in LDL, about 16, and total cholesterol. Not to the extent we are expecting. The reason is it is very small number of people involved, and also it's not long-term study. So it's only six-week study. But at least in human intervention studies, we were able to show grapefruit can reduce total cholesterol and LDL. That's a good news. We didn't see the big effect on HDL, of course. 
So this is again a paper published in uh, Metabolism if you want further information. So we also showed that the F2 isoprotein level is one of the oxidative stress marker. If you look at this, you can see that after taking the grapefruit juice, they were able to reduce the isoprotein level significantly compared to the control group. And again, this is also the same study, but they took the different markers, but it's not a long-term study. But at least it's an uh, indication that there is a potential of grapefruit on, on some of the cardiovascular diseases in humans. So this is another study in, in, in uh, Brazil. For example, again, uh, the normal, when they have a 6.2 cholesterol level, you can see that the re reduction in when they consume this, again, the, uh, orange juice, they see the total cholesterol is reduced LDL and L H HDL to H uh, LDL ratio and uh, aploprotein. So these are good markers. And when you go to the people with high cholesterol, more than 6.2, the trend is same. It's a good orange juice consumption for almost a year in this case. They were and in this case, basically these are people working in a factory setting where the orange juice factory was there. So there is no, there is no challenge for the researchers to convince the, the people who are working in the industry there to consume juice every day for one year. So they were able to show that there is a reduction in cholesterol significantly in, in Brazil. So the reason I'm showing also is this one is there is a a specific compound in grapefruit, we'll, we'll, I'll come to that in a minute. There are several compounds I mentioned earlier. Grapefruit is very known for presence of the naringen, which is one of the bitter compounds. That's one of the reason I saw only few hands raised, I eat grapefruit, not uh, when I ask orange, of course, several. But it is good compound. Naringen is one of the bitter compounds in grapefruit. But when you see that naringen in effect on, again, this is a human study, when they see that the pulse wave velocity, what does that mean is the index of uh, uh, arterial stiffness measurement. So on a healthy person, whether you are healthy or not, we have this arteries are measured and it is stiffness is there always 0 0.096 milliseconds. But when you consume this naringen in rich grapefruit, you can see that in six months you are able to reduce the stiffness point about 0.5. That's a big significant difference. Again, cardiovascular diseases are measured by different factors, but this is one of the factors which you can measure the stiffness. So by consuming the grapefruit with higher levels of naringen for six months, you can reduce the stiff arterial stiffness. So this is another compound in, in citrus, uh, particularly limonoids. Again, here you can see that the body weight is reduced with the high fat with normalin. This is an animal study. And again, the glucose tolerance is also reduced with the high fat with normalin. It's one of the prime comp limonoids in citrus. So this is animal study. You can see that there's a good effect on that. So now I'm going to switch to a little bit cancer. Again, this data, you probably, as a, as a student, you probably know that the cancer rate is increasing in the United States as well in other countries. So again, you can see that the man has more lung cancer. And uh, again, in this case, both women and men, that is 2011 data. But again, the numbers change every time. But what I'm showing you is the cancer is a killer. So we need to prevent it. As I said in the early stage, in the, before in my presentation, is there are a lot of evidence are still not there to prove that these fruits and vegetables, even citrus, has a significant impact on cancer prevention because of lack of human clinical trials. We have a lot of human uh, cell culture study and animal study, which I will show you in a minute, but very, very few studies are there in human situation. So this is, again, a list of some of the literature and laboratory studies. We, we published about more than 25 on different cancers with different bioactive compounds in citrus in cell culture. That's why I was saying cell culture doesn't mean a lot to the consumer. It may mean to the scientist and students for publication and getting tenure and all of that, but, but it's not really still not relaying that message to the, the consumer. Again, 150 articles on just citrus compounds. There are biological activities done on some of these compounds. Obiquinone, normalin, and epigenin have shown significant results. And modified pectin also showed, uh, this is again a preclinical trial uh, in rat model. A prostate cancer is re reduced. Some of these clinical trials, again, liver disease also, uh, if you consume limonene glucoside, is one of the limonoids, uh, you can reduce some of the liver disease and some of the inf inflammatory markers. And uh, with the citrus pectin, if you consume, it's a modified citrus pectin because of the lower molecular weight, it has better absorption. So basically your PSA doubling time will be reduced. So that means you can really 
prolong if there is a prostate cancer symptom, so by consuming modified cetrospectin. So if you don't know what is modified cetrospectin, it's unfortunately it is sold in the market for $80. But we, I, I, again, I'm not showing the results here. One of my students published some good papers. If you harvest the grapefruit in the month of January, that same modified fact in what you get in $80 is there in, in, in the albedo part. Albedo is the white part, not the, the outside part. So but sometimes the industry sells those. They have to really make money. So that's how they sell those as a modified cetrospectin. But it has shown very good results in preventing prostate cancer. Again, uh, there are the, just to show you, there are some studies with the cohort, the previous slide. So cohort studies has shown some potential effect on stomach cancer in human intervention studies. So with that saying that, what we do in our lab is mostly we try to use the bioactive uh, derived assays. We go from isolation of the compound to clinical level. So some may wonder, of course, you are nutrition students, you understand better, but I'm, if I'm giving a talk in public, they say, okay, that means you are trying to isolate these compounds from fruit and try to sell it, right? That's what they're asking questions. That's not our intention. Our intention is to isolate these, understand the mechanisms so that you can increase or decrease through breeding some of these compounds. If, the, if certain compounds are needed, we can increase in, through breeding or by other practices. That is our goal. So we do a lot of these bioactive right, derived assays. So this is the way we do isolating some of the limonoids from citrus seed, uh, juice, and, and then we, we take into until the purification. So then we take these compounds in different cell models or animal models to understand their mechanisms. So as I said earlier, I was not joking or I was not lying. There are 500 compounds in citrus. For example, here, if you take the volatiles, there are more than 300, just citrus volatiles. So how many of you smell the citrus smell? Like when you go to, that, that smell itself has some potential value to human health. I'll come to that in a minute. But there are 300 volatile compounds in citrus. So again, rest of those, again, you see that about 100 we already tested in cellular model, in different cell cancer models. So we purified almost 60 of those in our lab. So this is just a list of citrus bioactive compounds. So for example, here, we purified some of these compounds. We have these in our stock right now. Again, this is over 25 PhD students work in the last 20 years. It doesn't happen. It's, I have to give a lot of credit to postdocs and students. They have to struggle at least two to three years to get some, some, some of these compounds. For example, here, some of these, uh, the, the Pyrinicum rinse, it takes, even to get a few milligrams, it takes about two to three years. Again, some of these, like limonene, glucoside, it's not that hard but still it takes time. So for example, limonene is easy, but limonene glucoside is not the easy to get those compounds. So these are the compounds we purified in our lab, and these you can see that limonoids, flavonoids, I was not joking when I was saying 57, but this is not the list of 57 here, because of time I'm showing you some compounds in, in this list. So these are some of the publications, which you don't need to worry, but these are publications we based on, based on some of the bioactive derived assays of flavonoids, limonoids. Some of the furinocumarins publications on purification and testing in different models. Some of the polymethoxyflavonoids. So is that is, is that mean we know everything? As I said earlier, we know only about some of these, but we don't know as we go. If a new student comes in, he may find some new compounds in the same citrus species too. So still there are a lot of unknowns uh, in, in citrus to understand some of these compounds, even the role. So this one is to show you, sorry. This one is to show you how we evolved in terms of isolation, and particularly bioactive isolation, how we evolved over the years. For example, here, we used to use the soxalate extraction. We still have that, but that would take almost like if you use the column chromatograph, it would take about months to get to the purification stage to understand through NMR. So we have a little bit modified. You can see that we are using the exhalated extractor, and also we use the flash separation. So it will take you 30 minutes to get to the not that we can get everything in 30 minutes, but some of the steps you can reduce. Some of the students are laughing here. That is not 30 minutes. It takes days. But it still reduces a lot of time in terms of identification of some of these compounds. So this exhalated extractor is really helping. If you look at here, originally we used to maintain some of these temperatures. We were expecting all the compounds will be extracted. Now we, are, we can go with the exhalated extractor. We can go to 160 degrees Celsius. You can get some of these even in a methanol extractor, even water extract. If you get in water, that's great, actually. Higher than, like you see, the color means a lot of compounds are there compared to the old system. 
So again, this is just in you know, water extract has some of this. So if you're drinking this extract with water, you're getting all of these compounds. So this, you can see the peaks. So these are some of the target compounds, targeted metabolites. So if you see the plus three signs, that's basically almost confirmed, 99% or 98%. And some of them are like plus one sign is tentatively confirmed. So just in citrus species, we are seeing some of these compounds. Not just vitamin C, we see some of these compounds. Right? This is just one target metabolite analysis. There is another one we can do for non-target analysis also. You can go further and identify some of those. So the benefit of this for the nutrition student is just to show you an idea. So if, let us say if I have a high cholesterol, what happens to the high cholesterol in human study? So this is a study in humans. If you take the cholesterol, some of these are converted into four of these compounds. These are basically the cholesterol is almost going down, it metabolized with different pathways, which I'm not going to spend time, but this is a study, human study done. If they take some of this citrus juice, you can see some of these compounds formed, that means cholesterol is gone. You are really reducing the cholesterol in that way. And also some of the compounds formed are beneficial for the bone health, right? So it is really good for the heart health as well as bone health in terms of reduction of cholesterol by consuming citrus juice in general. Again, I'm, I'm going to skip quickly some of the slides. We isolate some of these compounds. These are different spe uh, species of citrus we used because I have less time now. So this is kumquat. How many of you ate kumquats? That's good. I'm happy to hear that. So kumquats are really, you can eat the whole fruit. If you don't trust me, you can try that, but wash the fruits, of course. <laughs> you can eat the whole fruit. The advantage of that is a lot of the benefits of citrus is in the rind. You can't eat grapefruit and orange like that, but kumquats, some varieties are really tasty. So you get the peel, uh, all the pectin, fiber, everything. So you, we tested some of these kumquats, and again, you can see that volatiles formed. So what we're trying to do is we try to show that some of these kumquats are good for cancer prevention in cell culture. Again, we can see that some of the P53 enzyme is elevated, and BAX is also elevated by using some of these extracts of the volatiles. Again, COX-2 is also inhibited, again, at a cellular markers, not in animal studies, but cellular level. And what I'm trying to show you here is uh, most of the other species have mostly about 80 to 90 percent of the D-limonene in citrus species. And this species has only 40 percent. But still, what is that shown you earlier is some of these compounds are not just because, the effects are not because of the limonene. Limonene is there in most of the citrus species, but it is only 40 percent here. There are other compounds, volatile compounds have significant effect on health. This is what to show you that limonene is one of them, of course. So this is after uh, using some of the emulsification, we're able to increase the absorption of the limonene in cell culture model. You can see that peak here, D-limonene. So when you use those, the blood orange, blood orange is another good species. So you can see that we, we are able to show some of the, mo uh, the markers for cancer prevention in a significant way with 100 parts per million of blood orange, blood, uh, orange extract in the colon cancer model. I'm, I'm kind of rushing here, but just to show you some of the work. So, the reason I'm showing you that limonene importance is there is a human study done. When they consume, this is a human study, when they consume the two grams of limonene, this is D-limonene. Don't confuse with the uh, limonoids and D-limonene. D-limonene uh, is a monoterpene, it's an essential oil. Limonoids are again triterpenes. So D-limonene is an essential oil when they consume two grams by humans, they were able to see that almost 40 percent uh, of the, uh, uh, the breast has some of this uh, limonene. That's a good news. That means it is going to the target organ. It, it has a potential to reduce the cyclene D, so which is, an, is a good marker to show that you can reduce the breast cancer. In early stage, again, a very small study, human intervention study, you can see that there's a good effect. Pyrolic acid is one of the metabolite which is not gone to the breast, but it has gone to the serum. So that's a good, so the bioavailability of the, the limonene is good in this case. It, it is going to the, uh, the breast tissue. That's a good thing. So if you're consuming some of these volatiles from citrus, uh, particularly D-limonene, there is an, a, a chance that you can reduce the breast cancer. So again, this just to show you, we published a lot of papers to, uh, on cell culture model using the different limonoids and flavonoids of citrus. I'm not going to spend any time on these just to, because my time is. So this is just to show you one slide where we picked 17, uh, 13 compounds from uh, lemon seeds. So we found that one compound, obiquinone, has shown very good 
reduction in, uh, in proliferation or increase in cell toxicity. So you can see that obekinone. So we use that compound for further cell culture. You can see that there's a reduction in MCF7, uh, the cell survival, as well as cyclin D is increased, and also the other markers have increased because of that, just to show you an activity of the just one compound. So again, we wanted to see in the MCF7 cells whether this obekinone is taken up. We were able to confirm that it is taken up and it is stable for almost 72 hours. So this is again to show you summarize, we tested several compounds in different tissues like breast cancer, pancreatic colon cancer. You can see that trend is good. Most of the things what we're looking for is there in most of the studies. Again, I'm not having time to show you all of that work now. But this is another animal study we did. Again, uh, some of the limonoids we tested in, in stomach, intestine, the GST level. GST is one of the enzyme which is a phase two enzyme. We want to detoxify some compounds that we need to increase the GST enzyme and quinone directase. What you see here is the, when you use some of the citrus compounds, particularly the limonoids, you can see the mixture and normalin. Normalin is showing very good activity. And you can see that here in two organs. And again, liver and even lung. There is a paper published on that. I don't want to spend time on that. But also, what we're curious is, what happens if you take the furon ring? Because there was, in a, back in about 10 years ago, there was a, at least theory that the furon ring is the one which is really active. So we tried to take it out. And then we also add the methoxime, just for fun. Of course, students are there. We want to do some fun studies, right? So we took the furon ring out. And you see that's a deferon. And then we added the methoxime. Interestingly, when you add that methoxime, you see that 130% increase in GST. So the question is, we're not here for modification of the structure. What we're also looking is this particular methoxam is there in different times of the harvest of the grapefruit. These are coming from grapefruit. That is our goal, not really mix and match and, and give it to as a, as a drug company. We're not there for that. So we wanted to see whether these compounds are there. So unfortunately, we have not seen methoxam formation during the harvesting time yet. We, we are, we're looking for it. So this is just to give an idea how this modification of the limonoids can make an effect on GST. These are animal studies. So again, this is a study with Dr. Turner, and we collaborated earlier. One of my PhD students worked on irradiation. So irradiation is post-harvest treatment when you want to ship the fruits from California to Texas or from Texas to California. You have to treat this fruit with methyl bromide. But now that's out of question because it is causing cancer. So you have to treat with irradiation to ship the fruits even within the states. Within, within the United States. So we had to do the irradiation treatment. So our goal was, when you treat the irradiation, to, of course, this is to prevent that Mediterranean fly or Mexican fly. Otherwise, it will spread all the orchards and it will kill the whole citrus orchard. So we, uh, one of my PhD students treated this with irradiation. And when we found this, when you treat the irradiation, you can see that there's an increase in some of the naringenin and narirutin compound by irradiation. So what we wanted to see is when you treat this fruit with the higher levels of compound is there, when you feed that to the animals, what happens to that? Is that small change in the narrow routine by the post-harvest treatment is going to really show some cancer prevention in animal study? That was our question. And I'll show that in a minute. So this is, again, what we see is the normalin is reduced significantly. So you can see that in aberrant crypt model. Again, Dr. Turner's lab can tell you more. I think she gave a talk a few, few months, a few weeks ago. So when you use the basal diet here, you can see the grapefruit pulp irradiated grapefruit pulp and some of the compounds, you can see there is a significant reduction compared to the control. But what you see here is there is no difference in the irradiated in uh, regular grapefruit. That means there is an increase in the, uh, some of the compounds, but that doesn't really relate in animal model. So sometimes we try to, as a horticulture, we try to increase some of these compounds. That doesn't mean it really relate in animal model or in the humans too. We don't know. So. So this is again COX-2, again, again, because of time, I'm just, you can see that there's a significant reduction compared to control and I knows. So what I'm showing here is, this is the list of potential benefits of citrus, but there's a question mark. You can guess why. A lot of clinical evidences are not there. We can just say based on the cell culture just to promote the citrus, but that's not what we are looking for. So we need more clinical trials to show that. So with that, I'm going to conclude here. I have several slides, but uh, I, I don't want to take a lot of your time now. So. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Two questions. Please make your questions short. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Yeah. 
this is a very excellent question, actually. Uh, I'll just give an uh, interesting study so you can understand why. I, again, I'm not promoting or not hating the supplements, but I'm not a good follower of taking supplements. Of course, some of these vegetables or fruits may not have enough quantity. That's why we, we always recommend to take supplements. But in most cases, so far in, in the research area, and at least I can give one study, it's called SELECT study. It has been promoted in, a, they spent 20, 30 million dollars, uh, they used vitamin E and selenium to prevent prostate cancer. So they found that prostate cancer is increased by using those two supplements. Again, having said that, I'm not saying that it's bad or good, but there are some challenges we have to address because we need to study first the the toxic effects. And the other, other good study is the beta carotene. This carrot study and uh, AB, ATB, study, ATB study that showed that they gave the beta carotene pills, 20, 30 milligrams, to the smokers group. They found the lung cancer is increased. But they, studied, they did another study with the carrot, they were able to reduce. But again, they, they gave this to the normal group. So because of the oxidative stress in the smokers group, they were able to find that the cancer is increased in beta carotene supplements. But having said that, some of the compounds, if they're potent, we need to address through the supplements only. Because you may get, and if you're eating all the types of citrus fruit, you may get everything. But how many of us will eat all the types of fruits and vegetables? That's a challenge. Yes? yes. On the set that we, uh, we talk about the, some promotion about, uh, of, the, of the burgers, they said there was a lot of vegetables inside the burgers instead of the meats. Yeah. And you look at the my place, there was a half of the half of the foods is completely consists of vegetables and fruits. But if the burgers, half of the burgers consists of vegetables and fruits, can we say it's also as similar as the my place of the suggestion? It is, yes, but what happens is again, I, I didn't really cover anything. We have a lot of data. If we try to cook vegetable or fruit, you may be losing most of the not most, I don't want to say most, some of the nutrients. Because if you're adding that as a part of the burger, of course, when you're eating vegetable, also we have to cook anyway, right? But certain, certain compounds may be lost. But if you're eating as a whole fruit, and also the fun part of that is if, if somebody brings a nice table, a nice plate with the fruits and vegetables, you'll enjoy it. The challenge is we are not ready to cut and keep it ready. So because you're getting fresh and you're getting most of the nutrients. For example, the vitamin C is lost by the time you harvest to go to the grocery store. Then after cooking, you're losing most of the vitamin C. Almost 50% of the vitamin C is lost when you harvest grapefruit or whatever the fruit, by the time it goes to the grocery store. There's no way you can prevent that loss because there's no way you can store in minus 80 those fruits. You can store only in certain temperature in the cooler, but the vitamin C is lost completely, or not 50 to 60 percent. So there are certain sacrifices we have to make. Okay, if, if ready-made, yes, definitely you to answer your question, yes. Having, eating burger with the vegetable and fruit is still better than not eating at all. So definitely that's good always. And there are certain things that are beneficial, like if you take a tomato uh, juice and if you add to the burger, the lycopene is more absorbed better than eating just uh, drinking uh, tomato juice. Because the absorption of the lycopene is better by, by eating ketchup or whatever you can add to the, the burger. Depending on how you eat the burger, of course. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Because of timing, so we will stop it here. And then just thank you, Dr. Kapir, for the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a really good thing. There's a formal lot, so this is really